Andrew Huberman in the house. A neuroscientist, professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford. Uh, you run a lab, Huberman Lab, which is primarily studying brain states such as fear, courage, anxiety, calm, and how we can better move in and out of certain things. The body has a huge and profound influence on our mind. And the reason is that we often talk about the brain and we think the brain, the brain, the brain. The brain is important, but the brain and the spinal cord, which is, makes up what we call the central nervous system, are extensively connected with the body, and the body is extensively connected with the brain and spinal cord. So the spinal cord is connected to the brain. That's right. The back, it comes up the neck, That's right. and it's, the actual nerves are connected inside of your brain. That's you right. Go all the way down to lower back? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so basically we are a big tube, uh, or our nervous system is a big tube. So your brain obviously is the thing that's shaped like more or less like this, and then the spinal cord extends off the back, and all that is housed in skull, except for two pieces of the brain, uh, which are the eyes, which are the, actually two pieces of the brain that are outside the skull. The eyes are a part of the brain. They are absolutely a part of the brain. They are central nervous system. So it's eyes, brain, and spinal cord. Make They're up. all connected. They're all connected. So if, and if you took that out of the body, let's yeah. say, they would all be connected. That's in some right. Way. They're contiguous, as we say. They're just one yeah. unit. They're one piece. That's right. And when uh, sometimes they get challenged, people say the eyes aren't part of the brain. And, well, then that means that the spinal cord is part of the brain too. And I, I want to be really clear: this is not semantics. There is a genetic program that ensures that early in development, during the first trimester, when we were all in our mother's bellies, the retinas, the neural retinas and eyes were deliberately pushed out of the skull. And the reason you have those eyes outside your skull is so that you can evaluate things at a great distance from you, right? Because otherwise everything would have to be in contact with you. Other animals do this mainly using smell. We are very visually driven. So a lot of our genome is devoted to vision and understanding what's going on at a distance from us. And that's afforded us a huge evolutionary advantage. To survive. To survive, because the, the more that I can anticipate events at a distance, the more that I can coordinate with my environment, like daytime and nighttime, but also when objects are coming at me, or things I want to chase and kill, or um, you know, you think about mating behavior and hunter-gatherer behavior, all of that, evaluating faces and face, facial expressions without actually having to come into contact with people, afford a huge evolutionary advantage. But I want to make sure that I answer your question thoroughly. The nervous system includes the brain, which we now know includes the eyes as well, the spinal cord, and then what's called the peripheral nervous system, all the connections with the body and every organ in our body, our heart, our diaphragm, our lungs, our spleen, our liver, all of it is, is it, as we say, innervated. It receives Connected nerve connections. To the brain? That's right, from the brain and spinal cord. So much so that if we were to just dissolve away everything except the nervous system, if we had a human nervous system splayed out here on the table in front of us, it would look like a human being. There would be a connection at every level down to, you'd be able to say that's the big toe and that's the pinky and that's where the heart would belong because it's almost like a silhouette of our entire body. And so when we think about the nervous system, it's really important I think for people to understand that the nervous system is all of that, brain and body and all the connections back and forth. And you know, there have been thousands of years of debates about what's the mind, what's the brain, et cetera, the mind-body problem, all that. I think it's fair to say in 2020 that states of mind include the brain, the activity of the brain, and the body. Those two things coordinate, the brain and the body, and have a sort of what I call a contract. There's a brain-body contract that gives rise to things like states of mind. So a feeling of depression or a feeling of awe or excitement or happiness. Which is a state of mind. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, we could talk about why. An, an, ex why, an emotional I, experience is a state of mind. That's right. I prefer to talk about states and states of mind because they include the brain and body. So just by saying mind, I don't mean just brain. They include the brain and body. And also because... So when you, may, when you say, sorry to interrupt, but no. brain and body mean thought and feeling? Yeah, so you're asking the key questions. Um, emotions are very hard to describe in an objective way, whereas states have certain properties that allow us to study them in different laboratories and from one experiment to the next. So um, some people may have heard this before, but we really, the brain does really five things. 
We have mm -hmm. sensation, yep. which is, you know, we're constantly being bombarded with sound waves and light yes. and smells and things. And that stuff is ongoing and you can't negotiate that. It's yeah. just you have these receptors in your body that allow you to evaluate those things. A sea turtle has magnetoreception. It can navigate by magnetic fields. Wow. We cannot do that, but they can because they sense it. Mm -hmm. You know, infrared vision in a pit viper or something. So unless you put on, you know, night vision goggles, you can't do that. Then there's perception, which is which sensations you are paying attention to. So as you write with your pen, if I say, what does that pen feel like in your hand? Now you're perceiving it. But right. the sensation was always there. Those receptors were always sensing it. So the sensation being the actual feeling or the actual visual, the perception is your interpretation of the feeling? Ah, so I would say that the perceptions are where your attention is, which sensations you're attending to. And then you have thoughts, and thoughts get a little complicated for us to parse because they are a little bit abstract. But thoughts are a combination of our perception, whatever it is we're attending to, and they have context, memory. You know, they're tapped into our, you know, they're tapped yeah. into our memory systems, right? Because if I say a pen and you're like, I don't know what your relationship to pens is, but mine is kind of a trivial one, I write with one. But let's say I come from a family that, I don't know, had a pen factory in Germany in the 1930s, then there's a or, whole... Or you got stabbed by a pen when you were stabbed by a pen, right. So it, it's very contextual. Yeah. So thoughts are like perceptions, but they carry memory and context. Thoughts are memory and context. Yeah, they include that. And then there are feelings slash emotions. And this is where it really starts to get abstract and kind yeah. of hazy, and where there's still a lot of debate. Because, for instance, if I ask you how you're feeling, and you say, I feel... Most people say, I feel good. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that's not a feeling. So if you ever do personal development work, they're always like, don't use a, don't say good or bad. What do you feel? And people will say, well, I feel calm and excited or something like, you know, when it, and it starts becoming very abstract. And so emotions are a real thing. Yep. And they certainly, perhaps more than anything else, recruit the brain and the body. When we feel depressed, we, we occupy certain postures. We feel it in our gut. We feel it in our limbs. We can feel fatigue, we can feel anxious, and so the, the emotions are really where you capture that mind, the, the brain-body contract and relationship very, very intensely. Okay. And then the fifth thing is actions. And what I love about actions and behaviors is they are very concrete. You're writing with your pen now, I'm speaking, I'm moving my hands. You can measure those things, you can analyze them, we know exactly what the neural pathways are. So we've got sensation, perception, emotions, and actions. Thoughts, yep. And then, of course, beneath all that, you've got memories, and um, people always like to raise intuition. You know, they always say, what about that sixth thing, intuition? And we could talk about intuition, but the reason I like to talk about states and the reason we study states in my lab is that states have two properties that are easy to study somewhat compared to emotions. And that's how pervasive they are, meaning how long-lasting they are. States tend to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Whereas emotions, it's sort of like they, they're more in combination. States are more like the primary colors from which you mix all the, you, the, you get all the emotions. Yeah. And the other thing is that they have an intensity that we can measure. You can have a state of being very alert or very drowsy or asleep. And you can say from a one to 10, how are you feeling in the state? That's right. And we can how measure much is that it. that experience? That, yeah. That's right. And we can correlate it with things like heart rate, heart rate variability, breathing speed, sweating levels of neural activity in brain areas that control wakefulness. And so I will be the first to say that I would love to be able to say that in my laboratory we are studying or someday we'll study awe and flow and all those things. But those are higher up on the ladder than we can get to right now. I think with the current technology, we can understand states and from there, I do believe that we can make a significant dent into certain mental health issues. Mm -hmm and optimize performance in certain you know, communities that are trying to optimize performance yeah. and in the general public. But the, the states that we're focused on are very concrete. For instance, alert and focused. That would be a wonderful state to understand and be able to direct ourselves toward when we're not feeling alert and focused. How but to get into that how state. How to get into that state. And we could talk about tools for that if you like. Sleep, sleep is so powerful and so important. I think now people really understand mm -hmm. the extent to which it's important in large part because of Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, and the important work that he's done in his lab at Berkeley and many other labs as well, of course. So focus, sleep, creativity, stress. These are the, the kind of core states that we would like to tackle first because we believe we can. Mm. And then 
hopefully in my career, but if not in my career, then maybe one of my scientific offspring or another right. laboratory, you know, 10, 20, 100 years from now, we'll be able to understand things like, how does one get into a state of um, empathy? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, we could spend the whole hour talking about empathy, but it's hard and it's a fascinating topic and it's so important, but it's just very hard to understand at a neural level. So we're starting with the basics, with the confidence that by understanding those basics, they will build up to richer representations and understanding of things like empathy someday. Yeah.